ऊपर So the cinematic winter of 1968 saw the release of two adaptations of Alistair MacLean military espionage thrillers. With its mixture of snowy landscapes, army spies, double agents and an action-packed ending, Where Eagles Dare has since passed into Sunday afternoon movie legend, whereas Ice Station Zebra sometimes feels like you'd still be watching it come Monday afternoon. And that's not to say it's a bad film, uh, far from it in fact. Uh, it has those great ingredients sprinkled throughout, uh, a mysterious plot, a race against time, suspense, intrigue. But it does make several mistakes that remove it from the upper echelons of the genre's greatest and most entertaining achievements. Let's take a look. So a top secret Soviet spy satellite, uh, using stolen Western technology of course, uh, malfunctions, changes orbit and eventually crash lands near the isolated British Arctic Research Station of the film's title. So having received a distress signal, the nuclear submarine Tigerfish, uh, commanded by Commander James Faraday, uh, played by Rock Hudson, is called upon to get to Ice Station Zebra, carrying the mysterious passenger Jones, uh, played by Patrick McGowan, uh, and eventually picking up two more, a Soviet defector, Boris Vazlov, uh, played by Ernest Borgnine, and a hard-ass American Marine officer, Captain Anders, played by Jim Brown. So McGowan's Jones is technically in command of the mission and isn't particularly forthcoming about its details, much to the frustration of Faraday. No. About your mission. Well, I wouldn't insult you by swearing you to secrecy or anything of that sort. I think the most expedient thing, since you have your orders, is to obey them. And as the mission proceeds, uh, suspicion over everyone's true nature and motives will see the Tigerfish's safety being jeopardised on its 600-mile mission to the polar ice caps. Now, Ice Station Zebra really is a film of two halves, uh, to use a bit of a cliche. Uh, quite literally so, in fact, with MGM aiming for it to be a, a big roadshow epic event, um, even inserting an intermission. Now, the half of the film that plays out before the intermission is a, a claustrophobic spy game aboard a submarine uh, that sees the main players sizing each other up and culminates in an attempt to break through the ice uh, that, along with some timely sabotage, kills one man and nearly destroys the boat. It's a standout moment in the film as water starts rushing into the boat and the sub goes into a dive. It's a great sequence and one that gives us a glimpse at just how high the stakes are for everyone, uh, with the east and west frantic to get to Zebra and it features a brilliant moment where Patrick McGowan loses his cool. Before we go any further, I suggest that you get me there, put another torpedo up the spout, blow a hole in the ice, and get me there! So far, so good, right? We get espionage mixed with a submarine and some excellent widescreen 70mm shots of the tiger fish uh, coursing northward through the seas. My only issue with this part of the film is the sheer attention to detail that we have to endure around the actual functioning of the sub uh, when we're spending 10, 15 minutes at a time watching orders being issued and levers and buttons being pushed. You can see why the running time is a bloated two and a half hours long. Now, before we get to the second post intermission, uh, half of the movie, we'll have a quick chat about the cast because it's great. Um, I've briefly mentioned McGowan, who was smack bang in the middle of filming The Prisoner and had to be released to shoot his scenes here. He's great in this, and re-watching it, I'd forgotten how good an actor he really was. Um, Ernest Borgnine, who I always enjoy, does a great over-the-top Russian accent as Vaslov. Um, he's initially the most suspicious character, and I think it's mostly just down to Borgnine having that mischievous look about him. American football legend Jim Brown, um, here in the early throes of an acting career, um, plays the tough Marine sergeant and doesn't get a massive amount to do, but Brown has a commanding presence, probably years of... NFL championship winning with the Cleveland Browns, setting him up well to deliver orders to his men. Sir. You will notify the men that there will be a showdown inspection at 0700. Yes, sir. And Lieutenant, it will be a bitch. Yes, sir. That's all. And finally, Rock Hudson, uh, in arguably the title role. Um, I think he struggles in company like this. Hudson's a legend, no doubt, uh, but I've personally preferred him in his more romantic roles. I don't feel he has the personality here to pull off the commander of a nuclear sub, um, certainly not one on a mission of this nature. It's a very low-key performance and he does get overshadowed by the rest of the cast. Hi, I'm Stephen at Real Classic Film Reviews. Guys, if you enjoy films like this Cold War espionage thriller, um, drop a like on the video and consider subscribing to the channel for lots more Real Classic Film Reviews. 
So once Faraday and his men arrive at Zebra, um, stumbling upon disaster and some more mystery, uh, the film shows glimpses of being an Arctic spy thriller. Um, and several of the scenes actually reminded me of The Thing or The Thing from Another World. Um, it's here the plot gets a little bit murky in terms of who's who, as the team all race to uncover some secret missing technology. Uh, now for me, this should have taken up the bulk of the film, and probably could have if we hadn't spent an hour watching consoles on the sub blinking or endless, albeit impressive shots of the submarine bobbing up and down in the ocean. You see, once at the base, and when some Arctic storm clears and we discover Soviet planes and their paratroopers are closing in on Faraday and his handful of men, the stage is getting set for an action-packed finale that sadly doesn't really happen. Um, a final confrontation with the Ruskies is a, a huge disappointment, resulting in a bunch of men in coats stood around on the ice. Now, I do appreciate that, considering the state of world affairs at the time, the film's release being smack bang in the middle of the Cold War, uh, that seeing Western soldiers gunning down the Soviets may not have been the wisest move, but still. Now, I think the disappointment in the second half of Ice Station Zebra probably wouldn't have stung so much if the actual production had been a little bit better. The minute the cast actually leave the Tigerfish, uh, they step into some hilariously cheap-looking stage-bound sets. Uh, we get a painted-in sky and some conveniently uniform little outcroppings of polystyrene, uh, sorry, I mean ice, uh, infamously. Despite sub-zero temperatures, nobody has frost on their breath and everything's lit as if it was filmed on a stage. Um, and that's before the arrival of the Russian jets slash model kits in front of some Arctic scenery. Uh, those sub-shots must have dried up the budget. Now, Ice Station Zebra either needs a good 30 minutes chopping out of it or a little less submarine and a little more Arctic action. And it could have been one of the biggest hits of the late 60s. Um, it has some great set pieces and some entertaining characters and an ending that's interesting, but maybe not as suspenseful as I thought it was. What size is the film? Four and a half inch reel, 16 millimeter in an insulated aluminium capsule. And all of a sudden, you know, a whole damn lot of about my business. It's overture and intermission, etc. are a bit of an unnecessary attempt to hark back to the big budget epics of the 50s and 60s. Um, I've been pretty tough on it here. Not because it's a bad film. It isn't. It's good. But it could have been great. Go check it out.